As Lisa mentioned, I'm the Vice President and General Manager of Global Education and Literacy at Benetech. Um, our goal in life is to scale solutions for underserved populations. And, and really, in global education literacy, we believe that access to information is fundamentally um, what we need to be able to be doing as human beings. Um, we use technology to drive lasting social change so everyone can learn, work, and pursue, pursue their dreams. Um, regardless of ability, regardless of disability, um, you know, allow people to reach their potential. So many of you have heard of Bookshare, some of you may not. We're the world's largest library of eBooks for people with reading barriers, blind, low vision, dyslexia or other um, learning disability or mobility impairment that uh, keeps you from using a printed book. So if you can't hold the book, can't see the book or can't decode the book, you qualify for Bookshare. If you don't have a disability, then you cannot qualify for Bookshare. It's a very special library that serves people with disabilities only. Um, and, and in doing that, we operate under US copyright law and now an international treaty that allows us to convert books under publisher permission or under, or even without publisher permission, convert books into multiple formats. So we have books in audio, we have books in what I like to call ebook karaoke, synchronized text and audio, uh, electronic braille. Uh, we have this industry standard publishing format and even a Microsoft Word format of all of our books, which, which is a great format for a screen reader, which reads what's on your screen. Um, the, 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 we can convert books, any book that is published in the United States um, without any permission. The flip side of that is we, we much prefer working with publishers and you'll see a little bit of those statistics later, but most of our books come directly from publishers as donations to say, hey, you know what? This is a great thing. Um, you know, help help us reach your audience with our books. So they give us they give us the books, we convert them into multiple formats, and then we allow people to access those in, in those multiple formats. Another thing that we do is we make sure that people can read it on any commonly used device, whether it's a phone, uh, we don't care if it's Android or, or iOS, a computer, a tablet, um, assistive technology devices. I mentioned e-braille, people go, what's electronic braille? It's a it runs on a little device that's, you know, about the size of uh, maybe three or four cell phones stacked at, up to the size of a kind of a standard keyboard, but it's a basically a reverse typewriter for Braille. The pins pop up underneath their fingers and then you hit um, next line. And so you can just read a book and it stores hundreds of books on the device um, and, and allows people to read on Braille. So again, we support any kind of device online and offline. We want people to read their way. Um, and that's, and that's, that's super important. Um, personalized learning is, is super critical. Um, we're funded, part of our funding comes from the United States Department of Education, the Office of Special Education Programs. And, and certain students um, read in different ways. Some read with their fingers, some read with their eyes, some read with their ears. Um, we want to be able to allow that student to personalize their learning experience. So our goal is any book, anytime, anywhere, in the format they want on the device of their choice. Um, and, that's, and that's how Bookshare has grown. And, and in fact, over the last you know, 15, 20 years, we've downloaded over 17 million accessible eBooks to people. Um, we have over 800,000 Bookshare users in 95 different countries. Um, I mentioned our publisher partners. We, we work with over 900 publishers who donate content to us. Um, we also do uh, go purchase books and scan them, but a vast majority of our titles now come from publisher partners. And we add something like 10,000 titles a month to the collection. Um, we have books in 47 different languages. So if a publisher gives us the little prints in French, we'll put it in. If they give it to us in English, we'll put it in the collection. If they give it to us in Tamil, or Marathi, or Bengali, um, or German, or you know whatever we have, we have books in a bunch of different languages. Um, not only do we have the largest collection of books in the world, but we power 15 national libraries around the world. 
uh, some of the some of the larger libraries um, in Canada, in Australia, in the UK, um, in uh, in the Middle East, in in uh, Africa, in Southeast Asia. Um, we we run national libraries around the world with a backend technology that also powers Bookshare. There is a call it a new normal or a now normal um, because it might be different tomorrow called uh, distance learning due to a pandemic. And we've had record growth through that pandemic because people have tried to figure out how to best get books to their students. Um, and, and um, you know, Bookshare has been a fantastic solution for them. Um, whether they're in the classroom or whether they're at home uh, trying to get that same education, uh, you know, Bookshare, Bookshare allows you to download books that way. And and through both Bookshare and through our partners, we we manage over uh, 1.5 million books, and and most of those are in remember in those five different formats. So it's really five million different reading options uh, for people with disabilities. So that's a little bit about Bookshare, um, but but let's let's get into kind of the meat of the presentation here. That 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 AI is important for what we do. Remember I said our, up front, I said we scale solutions using technology for underserved populations. And, and you know, the uh, folks with reading disabilities, reading barriers are, are very much an underserved population. The uh, World Blind Union states that 95% or more of all content is locked in printed form. So for people who go to the bookstore and browse the shelves and pull a book off the shelf and go buy it, or walk into the public library and you know find a book and pull it up. That those books are locked out, locked away from people with visual disabilities. So um, so it's a, very much an underserved population. As we convert books for that population, um, there's there's kind of multiple stages of it. Text the text conversion is largely solved um, in in the 1920s, optical character recognition, scanning an, a picture of a page and turning the words back into readable text. In the 20s, that was you know, converted text and telegraph code. And then in the 70s and, and again in the 80s, um, improvements were made uh, to that. Kurzweil in the 70s and then a company called Calera in the 1980s. Interestingly, Jim Fruchterman was at Calera. He founded Benetech and Bookshare um, in 2000. Thousand. So then text in multiple languages is largely solved. There are hundreds of languages that, that you can scan and convert back into readable format. Um, Script-based languages, Roman character sets, uh, languages using a bunch of different diacritics like Arabic languages. Um, the optical character recognition, OCR, uses um, some rudimentary form of AI in that it can learn and improve. So text is largely solved. Scale is largely solved. Google Drive, and you can scan OCR, Google's OCR engine is pretty good, and you can scan every one of your documents as it comes into Google Drive. They store, as of May 2017, they were storing over 2 trillion files. I would submit scale is solved. <laughs> um, we import about 10,000 books every single month, convert them into multiple formats. Um, so scale is not as much of an issue when it comes to text. But what if it's not text? What if it's STEM or STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math? So um, that's, that's a lot more challenging. Um, on this slide, I have some math equations. I have a picture of the Mona Lisa. I have uh, the chemical formula for caffeine, which is near and dear to my heart. I have the... Uh, the chloroplast stroma energy release. I have the cell reproduction cycle. That, that's not scannable. <laughs> Those can't be turned into words very easily. Um, and, and so all of a sudden you have some different solutions. So you put alt text on it to give it a quick example, you know, a picture of a woman. Well, a picture of a woman isn't very descriptive when you're talking about one of the most famous paintings ever. Um, you know, so it probably deserves a long description. Um, how do you describe that math equation that's sitting up there? Uh, a chemistry formula, charts and graphs, drawings and arts, uh, you know, engineering schematics. 
that that stuff, that steam stuff is hard. And so what that means is that it becomes very manual and very expensive and very slow. And because of that, especially in the global south, a lot of lower income countries, STEM topics are not taught to persons with a disability after their primary school education because they don't have the materials. You cannot study math unless you have special dispensation because you cannot get access to those materials. But, but, but what if we could automate it like we did text? Remember, I just talked to you about text and, and Bookshare, when we started in, in 2000, about 20 years ago, Bookshare started by using the ebook as a core format. And that's, that's an important, important element there because what we did was instead of taking a book and reading it into a recording, so human narrating it, or manually transcribing the braille, we took the ebook format and then we automatically converted it into text to speech. So we have an audio version of it and electronic braille and all of our different, we started adding more and more formats to support more and more different types of disabilities. What if we could automate STEM like that? And so that comes to, let's use AI to do it. And so just a quick primer, and I, I apologize, this will be super basic for some people, and I hope it's informative for others. Um, you know, AI is, you know, kind of all encompassing um, technology, uh, sorry, all encompassing phrase that utilizes a bunch of different uh, technologies. You know, you can think of AI as the self-driving car um, because it uses machine learning and computer vision and natural language processing and neural networks and, and a bunch of other technologies. But, but let me focus on, on, on these. Machine learning is really computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. Um, and an example of that is a classification engine. What category does something belong in? So if I can train my model to say, um, this is a dog, and this is not a dog. And so I show it, you know, a thousand pictures of dogs, and then I show it an elephant. Um, it should be able to say, oh, that's not, that doesn't look like those other things. What, <laughs> which of these doesn't belong? Um, and so all of a sudden you can use this as a, as a classification engine. And, and you don't have to show it a picture it's already seen. It knows that, oh, look, a dog is furry and an elephant is not, and so that's not a dog. Um, you can use it in regression analysis. Um, so predict the probability that uh, this internet purchase is gonna be fraudulent. Um, so a decision tree, things like that. Um, computer vision, so um, automatic extraction, analysis and understanding of useful information from an image or sequence of images. And, and a question actually, and I love this, thank you. A question came into chat. Um, before the presentation that said, um, hey, can we, can we use computer vision to describe graphs? And we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, but the, the sneak peek is, spoiler alert, yes, you can do it. Um, so extraction and also some understanding of useful information from a single image or sequence of images. So um, what, what, the way it works is it examines the data in very, very small blocks to determine pixel density. Um, so in graphs, which areas of the image are aligned and which areas of the image are not? And all of a sudden, when you understand in very small blocks, yes, this, is, this has pixels, this, you know, the pixel density in black, this does not, this does, this does not, you can start to recreate the graph um, and describe it that way. So we'll talk a little bit more about that that description. Um, natural language processing, read and understand human language. This is probably the most used of everything right now because of the Amazon Alexa and the Google Assistant. Um, you know, it assigns probabilities to a given sequence of words, and then you get pattern recognition and machine learning. So um, if I say really fast, elephant or teleplan, all of a sudden, you know, it's going to hear that at the beginning of teleplan, a, a very rudimentary engine might not be able to tell the difference between elephant and teleplan. Um, so 
it, but it, it'll learn over time. Um, and so we use it in data mining, in machine translations, um, in uh, context sensitive descriptions, uh, speech recognition, of course. Um, so the last piece is neural networks, uh, a type of machine learning that attempts to recreate a human brain the way a human brain processes. So what it does is it links together a bunch of different nodes or even a bunch of different other neural networks. An interesting way to describe it is, you know, so um, you'll 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 go through a decision tree and come out with an answer, and then that will determine whether or not it starts another action. Um, one way to think about it is if, if you ask a man to describe, I, I don't know why I'm hung up on elephants today, but if you ask a man to describe an elephant, but he can only feel the leg, so close your eyes and tell me about this elephant, and all he can feel is the leg he won't be able to describe the whole elephant. But if you put multiple people um, describing that elephant and they can each kind of piece together what it is, um, that's, that begins to get towards the neural network. So the even more importantly is what happens when that elephant starts to move? If, that, if each of those people can communicate about how that elephant is walking, you can start to put that process together. So linking um, different nodes and networks. So, so each of those technologies within artificial intelligence are used pretty extensively in some of the things that we're doing uh, within Bookshare. So what? <laughs> blah, 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 machine learning, blah, 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 train the model, blah, 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 computing and standards. Well, how about, what if we could use some of these techniques to address these challenges? Imagine now a book that comes to us from a publisher and, um, and because it's coming from a publisher, we get the text. They send it as an e-text, as an e-book. And so we don't have to convert um, the text into, into readable format. It's already there. But the equations, the math equations, come in as images. And, and they do that because they don't know if it's going to be on a small screen or a big screen or a large monitor. And the text will scale pretty easily, but the image, I'm sorry, the math does not scale as easily. So they turn that math into an image. And when it's a scalable vector graphic, by definition, it scales. So you get, you get text and SVGs. But what happens then is when it gets read, it says, solve the following equations, image, 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 end of list. And, and that is the, what I call the mathless math book. Um, and so by the way, that also happens when we um, scan a book. If we scan a math book, um, we can use OCR to turn the text into uh, words, but we still need to deal with the pictures of the, in, of the math equations. All right, so we use a class, classification engine um, using neural networks and computer vision. The first thing we do is we go through and we, we find all the math in the book. We run it through a classification engine to determine whether it's math or not math. Um, what is not math in a math book, you might ask. I say, it's a picture of a guy standing on a diving board with T equals zero at his feet and a dotted line to the water and T equals question mark. And it says, solve the equation, right? And so, or, or find the equation. That's not a scannable equation for us. We can't turn, we have to do an image description for that, but the quadratic equation might be, um, you know, hey, here's the quadratic equation. We know that this is a math equation. So then we send it to our classification engine. We get a confidence rating on whether it's math or not. If it's image-based math, then we can send it to a very specific math scanning, scanning engine, OCR um, scanning tool for math. We pre-process the image to make sure that it is scannable. And then we send that to the OCR engine. It comes back with the math equation. We get a confidence rating on that. And then we either send it to manual approval cycle or we just re-inject it. If it's confident that it's matching the equation, we re-inject it into the book. All of a sudden, what you're doing is you're taking literally months 
of time to convert a math book that has on average 5,000 and sometimes 8, 10, 12,000 equations in it. Instead of hand, having to hand transcribe every single one of those, you're able to do that with this classification engine and special math OCR engine. We're able to turn that math book in three days, two days. So what are the challenges there? Well, certainly having the resources to train the engines. Um, it, it can take weeks and weeks to train a complex model. And, and interestingly, as we get deeper and deeper into this and go beyond math, we have to determine whether this is a math formula or a chemistry formula or a physics formula, right? And, and they're different. And so all of a sudden you're building multiple models and training in multiple different ways. It takes a bunch of computing power. Um, we are a big Amazon shop. Um, and so we're able to scale up using AWS, but certainly not cheap. Um, you know, more data is more accuracy. It's, you know, these, these models are, <laughs> they're data junkies. Um, the, the more data you give them, the, the happier they are. Um, and then of course, tons and tons and tons of different content types. Um, I, I wish it would be, hey, Brad gets to set the rules, but there are standards that are in play because this is a global problem. So once the STEM items are described, how you display them and that, and that becomes a challenge as well. Um, and in fact, uh, I'll even use this example. Up in the top left of the screen, you see 12 slash 02 slash 2020. That would be today's date. But if you're in Europe, that would be the 12th of February because they go day, month, year. We go month, day, year in the United States. Um, and if you're a screen reader reading that, you're not sure if that's the date or if that's a math equation, 12 divided by two divided by 2020. So that's challenging, right? How, how do you, there's, there's some context there that needs to, that, that needs to come in. Top right of the screen, I have T parentheses E close parentheses equals S parentheses T close parentheses. Well, that might be a math or a chemistry equation or a physics equation, depending on what your variables are. But a screen reader might just read that as test because it doesn't recognize the parentheses or the equal sign if it doesn't know that it's math. So again, multiple challenges there. Um, I also have, let me make sure I can get display. Heading level two, determine the degree of each of the following polynomials. List two items, image, image. So that, that was straight out of a math book. And it said, determine the degree of each of the following polynomials. And then there were two math equations. And it said, image, image. And the entire page in that math book, when it's the math plus math book problem, that entire page says image, image. Even the word problems read incorrectly because they don't read as math. But using the techniques that we just talked about, classification engine, we'll go pull those, and now they're grayed out on the, on the slide and I apologize. We'll pull those images and turn them into math and it turns into Heading level two, determine the degree of each of the following polynomials. List two items. F left parenthesis x right parenthesis equals fraction start x to the four over x squared and of fraction minus 3.5 x to the 1.5 plus 0 0.85 math one of two. F left parenthesis x right parenthesis equals x to the six plus 2.5 x to the four minus fraction start one over two and of fraction x math two of two and of list. All of a sudden you have usable math need to be able to go back and forth to that because that's pretty quick. But when you get practiced at listening to what you read, when you get practiced at reading with your ears, you can transcribe and visualize that equation and start to solve that equation. That, that's where technology all of a sudden leverages AI without us having to go identify whether it's a math equation or not. That's where technology gives us the ability to scale a solution. We just went through and processed about 20 million images from math books in Bookshare. Eight million of them came back as math. So we've just added 8 million math equations into Bookshare for people to, to read. Um, so it's a, I mean, it's a complete game changer across the industry. Um, Heading level two, determine the degree of each of the following polynomials. Heading level two, two determine image, the degree of image. each of the following polynomials. List two items. 
F left parenthesis X right parenthesis equals fraction start X two. There we go. Sorry, started it again. So that's one place we use AI. Um, book image analysis for alt text and descriptions is another one. Rather than math, what if we see that it's not math in our classification engine? How about we then send it to another classification engine to say, is this um, a picture or not? If it's a picture, like a photograph, why don't we send it to a photograph um, uh, identification tool? And you know, Google has, an, uh, has a photo AI uh, descripting tool. Uh, Amazon has one, Microsoft has one, right? So they are commercially available. Uh, they cost a bunch of money. So you know, we're, we're still working through that. But the ability to do image analysis to add alt text you know, here's a coffee mug. Well, is it a coffee mug to show you that cup, you know, the coffee mugs come in green or is it a coffee mug to show you that there's steam coming out the top or is it a coffee mug to show you that it's a different vessel, right? So all text and descriptions are super important. All text is easier. Long descriptions all oftentimes need a ton of context, often from the author. Um, a recommendation engine we're all familiar with the Netflix or the Amazon type of recommendation engines. If you liked that movie, you'll like this movie. And it's based on how you ranked it and what other people who watch that same movie also like, you know, so lots of different um, machine learning and decision analysis there. Um, we are launching a smart speaker uh, client. And of course that uses the voice recognition stuff. And, and I mentioned the optical character, uh, the OCR, optical character recognition. So um, lots of different places and we will continue to use more and more AI within Benetech. Um, you know, two quick closing slides and we'll open it up to questions. Um, you know, accessibility for, for my audience, for people with learning disabilities and for people who have visual impairment, other reading barriers, Accessibility becomes a great equalizer for them. Screen readers, something that will read what's on your screen. Um, I mentioned that ebook karaoke, synchronized text um, that's highlighted and synchronized with the audio. So you can see the words as they are read to you. If you have severe dyslexia, that is, uh, it, it's, it's a brand new world because you stop focusing on what that word is and what that word is and what that word is. And all of a sudden you get to follow along as well as understand the meaning of the page or the paragraph. Um, you know, accessibility from a recommendation engines, accessibility from the text that we just, from the math transformation that we just talked about. Um, inclusive learning is, is really, really, really more important than ever. Um, and we like to think our technology makes information accessible for all. So personalized learning is the opportunity. Let me, let me stop there. We have just a few minutes for questions. Um, and let me close my... PowerPoint here so I can get back to where these questions are coming in. Um, I mentioned that somebody just before the program asked, what are the prospects for using machine learning to describe images or graphs? Marcus, thank you for this question. Um, in theory, human volunteers could label large training sets of graphs according to preset guidelines specifying key elements to be described um, and how to describe them. A system like this may provide near instant type of feedback Sighted people get from eyeballing graphs, which is to say it will add a visual interpretation layer on top of just, instead of just re I'm on top of, just reading data without capturing the essence of what is gained by the graphical representation. So uh, Mark, again, great question. Thank you very much. Um, that we actually about four years ago embarked on a project to describe the images in the top 100 children's books. And it's really challenging to describe images. The cat in the hat. If you're a blind child reading the cat in the hat, you don't know what a, the cat in the hat looks like. Is it a cat with a baseball cap on? Is it, um, you know, a, 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 who, who would think it's a tall cat with a top hat on, right? So describing those images becomes kind of a challenge. Graphs and some of the STEM topics are a little bit, interestingly, a little bit easier than that. Um, and we, we started working on a project that um, describes some basic graphs. So you could tell that it was a upside down or a right side up parabola. It was narrow or wide. It started in the uh, first, second, third or fourth quadrant. All of a sudden you get some 
information about what that graph might look like. Um, you don't wanna give every single point on the graph because you could be there for an infinite amount of time since there are an infinite number of points. But, but if you can give some basic information, if you could say, here's a parabola, uh, it is uh, right side up starting in the, four, in the, in the first quadrant. Um, you would know that it's a two degree equation that's positive. And, and that starts to give you some information about that. So, um, so great question. Yes, we, we, we're, we're looking at doing some of that stuff. And there's some, actually some other companies out there that are doing some interesting stuff as well. Another question came in. Imagine um, parsing diagrams is very different than equations. Could you speak a little bit more about how you parse and represent diagrams specifically? So we, we, just, we talked just a little bit about that. If we can use computer vision to determine where there's pixels and where there aren't, of course, you have axes, which become a little bit of a challenge because you say, oh, there's pixel density here. And is that part of the graph or is that part of the axes? Scale becomes a little bit of a challenge because you, if it says, you know, where is the apex of this uh, graph? You have to know what your scale is. But so, so it's not easy, but you can certainly describe what um, the graph looks like. Um, and and arguably you could do it in pretty good detail. Interestingly, of course, the math books don't always have a perfectly accurate image. So it says, you know, um, where is this apex? Um, and they might label it as one comma one, but it might be shifted off. So if we go too detailed, we might find that it's actually in the drawing that we're describing because the computer doesn't doesn't match it in the drawing it might be at 1.25 1.25 so um so you know there's there's a little bit of accuracy that you have to play with as well um question came in what special math ocr engine i can take one more question lisa says thank you very much um, what special math ocr engine do you use to render sophisticated mathematical formulas and equations so there's a couple of them that are out there we're using um in there's a uh, Infty Reader, I-N-F-T-Y Reader. Um, there's also a group that we work with called MathTix, M-A-T-H-T-I-X. Um, and I think right now in our in our models we're using MathTix because that also gives us the confidence rating on how accurate their OCR is based on um, the image that they get. So um, uh, check out MathTix. Uh, 